Hi, Poppy. <laughs> Hi, Alistair. So, uh, before we get started, tell me a little about your background. Uh, well, I'm. Uh, my name is Poppy Crum. I am the head scientist at Dolby Laboratories. I'm also a consulting professor at Stanford in symbolic systems and music, and Center for Computer Music and Mu Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. Is computer research in music and acoustics something that existed ten years ago? Uh, oh yes, it is. Uh, the, the, that particular group at Stanford is is a really fabulous sort of uh, think tank and generator of many interesting ideas. Some of the founders of it uh, were the you know, invented, uh, came up with. Uh, some of the key uh, evolution of FM synthesis. Uh, Max, John Chowning, Max Matthews was uh, sort of came from Bell Labs and has been you know, cited as being the inventor of digital audio. And so oh. It's an interesting place, and it's been there. We just had, I believe, the 40th anniversary of Karma. <laughs> so, uh, digital audio seems to have created this sort of Cambrian explosion of music science because mm. uh, one of the people I talked to in the music industry said we didn't realize it at the time but when we published CDs we were giving everyone a master. Yes. <laughs> and so all of a sudden analysis, you know, lets a thousand points of light bloom, a number of open source projects that now have access to the music data they can analyze where they couldn't before. There's a democratization in that way that I think is really great. So, um, absolutely. And if you think about uh, something that brought me back to the music, and I mean, I'm a, my background is actually um, uh, my undergraduate's in violin performance. I also always made extra money making records and working in the audio industry. Um, I went on to study neurophysiology and really sensory perception of multiple senses. But one of the things that brought me back to technology was, um, you know, I, I'm friends with the inventor of MP3, and and some of the technologies that you know lossy data compression algorithms that suddenly took advantage of basic science and understanding of our sensory perception to efficiently give information to people in such um, uh, tractable units, it, it, you know, it completely changed the music industry. So right. you had fundamental changes there. You know, at Dolby, obviously, uh, Dolby's been steeped in uh, thinking about sensory perception and always never forgetting about the human experience and what that means. Uh, with regard to how they build their algorithms. Um, so. so, I mean, people are probably most familiar with Dolby noise reduction on the cassette deck getting rid of the hiss, but um, give me, you were talking earlier about some of these um, other music formats that can carry data. So where do you think the future of music formats is headed? Uh, so some things that are definitely changing, uh, you know, I think you know, one place where you interact with Dolby that people probably aren't familiar, you know, are less uh, familiar with, but they, they see every time they watch HDTV is when you watch HDTV, you see a little thing that says Dolby Digital. You know, Dolby Digital is a perceptually lossy codec. It's, it's a, a coding algorithm that reduces information in, in its transfer through uh, it, it, a model of your, it's essentially a computational neural model. It's a very simplified computational neural, not that simplified, but it's a computational neural model of the cochlea. And um, yeah, the future, new, you know, as we go, you know, that, that was HDTV. As we see transformations to the, the next stage of how we consume content, uh, things that are becoming very prevalent are uh, more and more metadata, more and more information about the sounds, information about uh, personalization, you know, that you have the ability, you, know, you, you aren't sort of given the answer. You're given information and opportunities to, one, have a closer tie to the artist the artist's intent, because that more information about the artist's intent can be captured, so that when you actually experience w the sound or the music, and you that information is 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 there to dictate how it deals with your personal environment. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, Dolby Atlas is uh, our cinema a cinema based uh, technology that transformed. Uh, Cinema, how we experience sound in the cinema, such that in a typical you know, theater of five years ago, when you would go to the theater, you know, I think the, the most you would experience is you, maybe you heard of five one seven one. Right. Um, you know, that means that content is mixed. It is then you know presented in the theater. When something goes to one of those, each, those numbers represent channels and that that mean in a in a typical theater that would mean a whole bank of speakers would respond when in information sent to that bank of speakers and that it's always going to static you know locations sure. 
today, Dolby Atmos and other technologies are have transformed that, I think, quite substantially, where I can take a sound, I'm a mixer, I can mix now, say, instead of seven channels, I can mix 128 sounds, and each one of those sounds has a data stream associated with it. Right. And that data stream carries information about, you know, it, it's not going to a particular set of speakers, it's going to a, you know, has XYZ coordinates, it has information about the diffusity of so that sound. So somewhere behind me to the left, and then the speakers work out what that means. Exactly. On the, okay, it's it. done, sure. and it, it deals with the, infra it, now every speaker is treated independently, right. but it also treats the environment very uh, specialized. So it's like rendering on the client almost, it's Absolutely. rendering at the edge. Yeah. Exactly, so it's a rendering algorithms, and those, you know, and you can carry information not just about where, but how loud, how wide, how diffuse, and it's going to wow. figure out the right out, you know, amalgamation of different speakers. And, and you uh, said this is being applied to DJs. Uh, yes. Yeah, so <coughs> the, you know, that's it's been very successful in the movie industry. I think uh, you know, uh, Gravity is an example of that. The uh, one Academy Award for best sound mixing that was done in Dolby Atmos, and it's it's really powerful if you see it. I highly recommend it. Um, but. You know, now taking that uh, Dolby, we've actually put, you know, tried this out in different, uh, with different DJs in some theaters and, and things like that, so. Um, what other metadata could you include in the music? Uh, so Can you, you include, like, song provenance and titles and, like, is there, what else could you encode in this data? So, you definitely can encode metadata with music in those ways. Um, you know, you can, you know, Stepping aside from Dolby, what 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 capabilities do you have to to, to put into music? You know, I'm I'm interested in. You know, I think about things like um, what type of personal. You know, if I want to capture, uh, you you could have complex neural models that actually live as metadata with you know with the music. Things that are specific to an individual, and you know now are entrained in all of my. Uh, what, what's what's shared? Um, if you think about if an artist is creating information, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm thinking a little bit more. If you're if you're going from say Atmos, some of the things that you know Dolby Atmos would do. If I want to do, you know, if I'm a musician I w and I I'm working in um, electronic music, or I have something, you know, I have some spatial positioning, and you know, I have things moving in space. That would be, you know, carried okay, in. Okay, sure. It. So like an, an attribute of a synthesizer might be. Positioning, you'd have that tied to an oscillator, and it would actually render it on the speakers rather than having it recorded on the sound. Yeah, you could have uh, GPS coordinates right. there that well. you, pe people hear mu hear particular pieces of your music when they are in a particular location in the world. Oh yeah. wow, that's something that you could do. Um, so changing subjects a bit, um, one of the given the feedback loops of we were looking at biometrics and human response to particular sounds, and then using those feedback loops to say this person liked it or made them happy or sad. Uh, some of the people I've spoken with said, you know, we may f we may eventually get to these machine-generated drones that kind of go, here's a low-pitched buzzing that seems to make Poppy happy at certain times. We're going to use that. Um, you know, th so this idea of computer-generated sounds to produce emotions and some kind of feedback loop uh, as a maybe dystopian view of music, like this tone happens to make Alistair sleep well or make me productive or whatever. Um, where's neuroscience in terms of figuring out the feedback loop of producing some kind of sensory input and then looking at how it changes your behavior. Um, okay, so those interesting questions. There are lots of companies considering that that have been thinking about that in the music space for sure. You know, the number of companies that you know, use GSR, you know, Gavonic Skin Response, some sort of maybe, maybe some EEG, you know, uh, simple EEG metrics to try to drive your playlist and measure your heart rate and keep you in a certain state that you're trying to achieve. There, there are multiple people looking at that. Key problems though are. Um, you know, obviously the baseline, you know, there's a lot of other sensor integration you need to actually get to a useful state of that type of information. Um, but nonetheless, it, it's there. The questions are there, the problems are there. It's just are, you know, are physiological states the right thing to track or do we get, a, get to a better place through a computational model that doesn't include anything about my sensory physiology? Um, I think, um, you know, one of our labs, one of my, one of the labs that my group, you know, has a, works with at Dolby is, you know, in, involves closed loop feedback sensing, 
uh, to think about a lot of different technological interfaces. And uh, emotions is, emotion sensing uh, is definitely one of them. Attentional processing would be others. Um, you know, and it's a, it's a matter of integration of a lot of these senses, a lot of these different sensors and, and how you put them together to get to something that's more useful than, say, tracking just my, you know, heart rate. Okay, one last question. If you could know anything about, if you get any piece of data from the way someone experienced music that would help your research, what would it be? I don't know that this is something that will dry, would drive technological innovation for me, but it's something that I'm really interested in, is uh, one, how it, uh, attentional, how it modulates my attention, and um, so I have trouble disconnecting from music when it's around. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, uh, Different, you know, I've, I've been asked, you know, something that I've been asked before and I, I think is a question we have to think about in the future is, and this is maybe not the one thing, but I think there's a really interesting space in data science and music to, to consider this, which is, you know, in the past the way we consume music was very different than it is today. You know, Spotify and our ability to, you know, have, you know, a, a smorgasbord of d options at our fingertips. I had to use a Swedish example. <laughs> has, has definitely changed how we consume music. It's not, you know, you know, as a musician, I grew up. It was a, it was a very, a lot of intent and attentional process was put on uh, every time I uh, engaged with my musical consumption, right. and that definite, that's a very different process than, you know, the sort of sampling that we have today, um, and and there's no question that famili familiarity. It, it drives appreciation and allows you to appreciate more complexity in different, you know, and engage with a much more sophisticated style of music, you know, for that manner. That those things happen. You don't appreciate Schoenberg maybe the first time you hear it, but you know, as you listen to it, you fall in love with it. And uh, you know, there's for many different reasons, and um, maybe not everyone does, but <laughs> Pierre Luna or something like that. Um, but that sampling that we can have, you know. It, music becomes a soundtrack to your life that helps you harness your attention. And you, know, you, build, up, you build a context, a familiar context that I think is in this noisy environment, music now serves as this sort of soundtrack to your life that helps you, you know, harness your attentional processes by engaging that common context that you can control which is something that we didn't used to be a, used to use music for in the same, to the same degree that we do today. Um, so it's an, an antidote to ADHD because it sort of Precisely. provides a common thread. That's but I think that's a huge, I mean, that, that, that's very powerful. Right. Um, you know. So as far as data goes, you'd like to know what is, how is someone's attention wandering based on what they're consuming and how they're consuming? And, and how is my productivity, how is my cognitive right. load reduced by adding information? Sure. And by adding information, I'm more productive. I can, I can actually you know, take in more information, which is obviously counter, in some ways counterintuitive, right. but still very true. And so those things uh, are, are interesting problems. What do you think will be the biggest technological change in music in the next 10 years? <laughs> I, I think there are a lot of opportunities in metadata to make music a much more interactive, engaged experience. And so I hope that that is something that we figure out the right ways to do that. And, and that may be in VR, it may be in AR. I mean, I, I do think some of the you know, VR experiences with um, embodied music concerts and consuming a concert uh, you know, at, at, um, in a VR experience that I can't attend are, you know, it's, it, it is a powerful experience. You know, I think I, I, I was uh, working with some girl it was a STEM event, but girls who had never experienced VR, and, and VR is in a very nascent, I mean, it's been around a long time, it's still in a nascent stage in <laughs> consumer ad, you know, adoption, but you know, put them, you know, had a, some content captured by Jaunt, who's capturing live concerts uh, in a VR environment with, um, you know, Dolby Atmos of the concert, right? And um, So it's re-rendering the audio based on where she is in the concert in the VR headset? Uh, correct. Wow. Correct. Yeah. And uh, it was great to watch. These were 14 to 17 year old girls put right. this on and their mouths were like agape. They were like. You can fly up next to the speaker where it's too loud and only hear the bass kind of thing. Wow. Exactly. Yeah, there, yeah. There's a lot of power of working with sound in that way. I mean, the thing is going to, in the, in the same way that we're still, you know, um, the music mix, I mean, the, the cinema, the sound, you know, the mixers um, for cinema are, 
you know, they have a new tool set. Every time you have a new tool set, you start out very, you often start out very conservative and sort of figure out this new way of working in these spaces. You know, 10 years working in these spaces, musicians, both, you know, live musicians, but, you know, and musicians creating, you know, how they want to be represented for their concerts and, and how that, that home experience takes you allows you to really engage in that way. I think that's going to change a lot, and it's it, there's a lot of power, but there's also a, a learning curve for the artist. Awesome. So. Thank you so much. Thanks.